the U.S. accounts for the largest group of professionals in Taiwan's gold card program. The employment gold card functions as a four-in-one resident visa, work permit, alien resident certificate, and re-entry permit. So far, the program has attracted around 6,000 professionals. We take a look at how Taiwan is attracting Americans and other foreign talent to the country amid the region's fierce war on talent and declining birth rates. Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news and analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Betty Chen. I'm Rath Wang. Coming up on our show today, in Taiwan's attempt to win the global war on talent, the government introduced the Employment Gold Card program in 2018 to attract foreign professionals to the country. There have been almost 6,000 gold cards issued to date. Then we hear from Tom Fifield, the National Development Council's Gold Card Office Project Manager, on what his office is doing to attract foreign talent to Taiwan. We're very fortunate to have had uh, 5,500 gold card holders uh, from 91 different countries. And the uh, U.S. nationals are, in fact, the largest contingent of that. We will then discuss how Taiwan's gold card compares with Singapore's employment pass and those of other countries around the region. We also hear from Oregon native Mary Goodwin, National Taiwan Normal University Department of English professor, about why she decided to make Taiwan her permanent home and become a Taiwanese citizen. There are just so many, so many reasons to recommend Taiwan, and especially as it's in the spotlight now uh, with its uh, big, uh, its problems with its big neighbor. Um, it just makes you, I think, m a little bit more nervous, but definitely more very, very proud of what Taiwan has been, do has been doing. Lastly, we will discuss how Taiwan is working to boost its competitiveness in continuing to attract more foreign talent. Welcome to the show. Joining us in a studio to discuss this today is Albert Cho, Professor of Political Science at Donghai University. Albert is an expert in international affairs and Taiwan's foreign and social policies. And Nick Tang, Artnet front-end engineer, a Taiwan gold card holder from Philadelphia, the United States. Glad to have you back, Professor Cho, and also a warm welcome to Nick. I spoke earlier to Tom Fifield, Taiwan National Development Council Gold Card Office Project Manager, who oversees all gold card initiatives at the central government level. Tom is also the Immigration Environment Task Force lead. And I also spoke earlier to Mary Goodwin, professor at the Department of English at National Taiwan Normal University. She is a native of Oregon, but is also now a naturalized Taiwan citizen. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been a large surge in gold cards. As we can see, with over 1,000 in 2020 and almost 2,000 in 2021, and 2,644 almost hitting 3,000 in 2022, the largest group by far are from the United States. Nick, I believe you're also part of this COVID wave, or if you say large surge. Yeah, correct. Uh... I applied at the same time as the rest of the COVID exodus group. And then I, yeah. and then I, I came later, actually. Um, professor, um, I wanted to ask you the first question. Okay. Um, we just saw in attracting high caliber foreign professionals, Taiwan began issuing f these gold cards in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, it started from 100, and it's now over 6,000 in terms of applicants and there are now over 5,000 foreign professionals on this gold card in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. What do you believe is behind this surge? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, if you look at the uh, visiting, uh, you know, visitors from the foreign countries like Western countries, United States, Canada, and so on, uh, and also other countries from Southeast Asia, uh, the, the population in China has been increasing in the, in, in, in the past, had, had been increasing in the past. But uh, ever since the uh, you know the pandemic uh, outbreak, uh, the situation kind of shifted. Now we see a lot of foreigners coming to Taiwan. Maybe uh, Taiwan is still a small island, small country, but uh, 
it sort of like replaced China as a second destination because number one, we have democracy, we have the freedom of speech, and people appreciate the value of the uh, you know Western type of uh, lifestyle here. So a lot of uh, people like um, like Nick and also other our international friends are, are more than happiness. Uh, more than happiness to visit Taiwan and perhaps stay here longer. That, that's number one. That is why you see the surge, uh, you know, in, in the past several years. The number two is that I think the government uh, in Taiwan, regardless, uh, you know, DPP in power or KMT in power, I think they are really uh, fear this sense of urgency to 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 have more people to join us. Uh, but there are some caveats to that. I will explain that later. But first of all, uh, you know. The people in Taiwan, we need high-tech uh, professionals. For example, uh, people work for this uh, chip companies. Uh, you know, they can help us to to write programming, you know, online and stuff. Uh, but but most of them uh, are very high paid. I mean, if we want to hire them, we have to pay a lot of you know, salary to them. So that that's one challenge because in Taiwan, normally the wage issue is kind of you know sad. Uh, even me as a professional, I have a PhD in United States. Sometimes, well, I have to confess, <laughs> often I feel I'm, I feel I'm underpaid. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that's number one issue. A and the second is that I I think a lot of people come over to Taiwan. Uh, they do want to find a new life. Uh, I remember when I was in the States, uh, some of my Japanese friends, they, come, they, they went to the United States for a different type of, of life, different from what they had in Japan, because they, they thought Japan, the life over there was too uh, rigid, too restricted. In terms you know, of work environment. Restricted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So some people like, come, come over to Taiwan for that kind of dream. Uh, some of them are backpackers and you know, whatsoever. But anyway, I think now we have witnessed a uh, kind of structural change in this uh, immigration uh, kind of pattern now in Taiwan. And I'm not sure what that will end up uh, being, but I think we do need to grasp this historical opportunity to change the structure, including the wage structure in Taiwan uh, overall. Do you feel it has um, enhanced Taiwan's soft power and how the world sees Taiwan with this influx of immigrants. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, just, just like what I said, Taiwan is a small country, and we don't have that much military capability. We don't have that much uh, resources uh, in here. 90% uh, of our uh, industry is really uh, heavily uh, dependent on the imports and ex also e exports business. Including people. Including people, too, right? So. Uh, I, I think that's uh, really because of the softer parts of Taiwan has been attractive to the international society, and, and not to not only to the Western society, but also to you know countries less developed, like in the Southeast Asia, even in Africa. So I, I think we have to work on that. Plus, I think that the Muslim culture, the Muslim population now has been the biggest, uh, maybe uh, you know, besides the Chinese population, has been the second biggest uh, population in the world. But in Taiwan, you know, like we are uh, pretty much uh, still living in the Chinese culture where we eat a lot of pork. Mm -hmm. But Muslim population, they don't eat pork. So I, I think that's kind of a restriction on them, even though some of them see uh, you know, the employment opportunity or even the payment, I mean, the uh, salary structure is here is li slightly better than in Southeast Asia. So they are more willing to come over here. But still, you know, we have to, you know, adjust a little bit in order to invite uh, more of them come over here. So this is actually a drawback for them to come for right, yeah. Palau and all this other. Right. Definitely, I think there must be some areas where Taiwan can improve, and we will talk about that later. Sure. And now I would like to direct my question to Nick. Nick, there has been a large surge of Taiwanese Americans and other Americans who have relocated here as part of the gold card program during the pandemic. As you can see here, the U.S. accounts for about 30 percent of all gold card holders, followed by Hong Kong and then Japan as the top three. So my question for you is, what is your own experience and how significant was the pandemic in influencing Americans to move to Taiwan? And what, what areas in Taiwan that really attract you? Um, well, I think what happened was initially when lockdowns happened in the U.S. all over, um, uh, people started looking to Taiwan because they realized, oh man, uh, everyone is still free there. No one's being forced to stay inside. Everyone is unmasked, walking around, living life as, as if it's still 2019. Um, and so I think that's why there was such a huge wave initially of people applying for the gold card and moving to moving here. Um, I, I applied at the same 
around the same time, I actually didn't even know about the gold card program till towards the end of the year, towards the end of 2020. Um, but then I, by the time I actually wanted to move here, it was the opposite, where America was opening up mm -hmm. and Taiwan was locking down. Were you disappointed? <clears throat> I was disappointed. Uh, <laughs> I, and and it, was, it was actually not the easiest decision because I was basically having to decide upon, okay, going back to the way life, for the most part, going to, way, to the way life was, or moving to Taiwan where I might have to do this all over again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, I forgot what was the... What was the other part of your question? Just about my own experience? Yeah, just your experience and uh, what made you make the decision that you want to uh, move to Taiwan in addition to the freedom that you just explained? Are there any other areas that really attract you? Yeah, uh, honestly, I wanted to move to Taiwan way before the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, because I have lived here before for a year, so I, I knew what I was in for. Um, I think Taiwan is, there's, there's so many, this is, it's such a really safe place. Um, so along with the safety, there's the food. Uh, I, I definitely don't think it's the best place for international food, but mm -hmm. in terms of everything else, like uh, it's, it's really difficult to beat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that really goes to, that's really a, uh, Asia in general, but Taiwan especially. Mm -hmm. um, and then for me, like the safety is the big part because I've, I've had my laptop stolen before in San Francisco just stepping into the bathroom mm -hmm. um, but here it's it's fine to just leave your leave your things out and then go away go away for hours at a time if you have to and then come back and everything's still there yeah not, don't be that certain it's I don't still, do it. <laughs> yeah yeah it has to be very cautious about yeah. it <laughs> Yeah. Right. But in relative sense, yeah, it's, it's safe in Taiwan. Yeah. Yes. So safety is definitely a main attraction for a lot of international people moving to Taiwan. Right? right. And the other thing, I don't know if most people really think about when they think about moving to Taiwan is that it's such a, a good location. Just being in, being here, you can fly to other parts of Asia mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. more easily than if you're just in the U.S. and you want to take a vacation to somewhere. It's just one fl one long 20 hour flight. And, and then you have to go back home. Mm -hmm. But if you live here, then you have the choice to go wherever you want in Asia mm -hmm. over, over a weekend. Exactly. Yeah. What's the number one thing that made you make that decision? Do you feel there's anything you can ad give advice in terms of moving here compared to life in the US? <clears throat> uh, I think that moving, moving in general to somewhere where you're far away from your friends and family is, is just difficult. So just be prepared to um, start, really start over. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you have to really be open to just meeting new people. Um, and yeah, I think the, the language barrier is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, even, even though like my Chinese has gotten a lot better, uh, I, I still find it frustrating sometimes to be in a group of people, of locals, and then they'll, they'll be talking happily amongst themselves. And I'll only understand 70% of it, mm -hmm. but that 30% that, that I'm missing is a big deal because mm -hmm. I won't really know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think the, be ready for the kind of like that, that kind of uh, cultural barrier. Um, and I guess be willing to study, like you, you have to learn Chinese here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of cultural barriers and other difficulties, um, we're now going to talk a bit about why these people have left gold card holders. Statistics show that 40% of card holders have left Taiwan, while 35% are paid overseas, as we see here with Nick. If we look at the industries where gold card holders are working, economics accounts for over half at 51%, and Taiwan's key industry where chips are manufactured Science and technology is at 28.8%. Um, professor, mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, in terms of all these industries, does this, could this be seen as a substantial talent drain for Taiwan, given mm -hmm. the influx of gold card holders coming in and just going out? Uh, well, you know, like, I think one of the advantage of Taiwan is in its uh, chip making. And the, the chip industry, you know, especially TSMC is the world, uh, you know, the, the largest company and also the number one company. And 
it deals with a lot of uh, uh, defense or you know uh, high tech companies uh, products. So I, I think Taiwan is is very very good at this. And also on the other hand, we do want to pick up more R and D uh, skill from more advanced countries, for example, the United States. Okay, so so we. In terms of that, of course, we need to uh, hire more personnel from that area. That's number one. And number two is that uh, I, I think just like what you just showed on the statistic, you, you say 35% uh, uh, who receive this card now is, uh, is overseas? They're actually employed by overseas companies, say US companies in Silicon Valley, but mm -hmm. working and living in Taiwan, paying Taiwan taxes. Mm -hmm. So basically, they work remotely. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means that this strategy, uh, at the least, uh, at the first step, is successful, right? Mm -hmm. So they are willing to stay in Taiwan, just like uh, what Nick mentioned. Because I mean, plus one of the uh, thing we have to notice that because you are, you guys are Asian American, well, actually Taiwanese American to be specific. Mm -hmm. So you, you have that kind of roots and connection. But when, we, when it comes to, uh, for example, uh, the German Americans, they come over to Taiwan for what? Uh, other than they're married to a local, you know, uh, Taiwanese uh, girl or Taiwanese husband, I, I don't think of any other reason mm -hmm. uh, can, can make him or her to come over here because like what I said, the, the payment, I mean, the uh, salary structure is not that, not that good. But the gold car uh, strategy and also this policy uh, initially is intended to make uh, things easier for them to come. Uh, less uh, logistic barrier, uh, you know, if you want to re-enter Taiwan, make it easier as well. So I think just simply looking at the statistic you presented to with us, I think it, it, it's initially it's a good start, but still not far enough, mm -hmm. right? Um, second is that uh, we have to think of uh, everything in Taiwan, as long as, uh, you know, whenever we talk about, we want, we want international, community in Taiwan, not only in the main, mainstream society, but also in, on campus, like where the mm -hmm. university I, I work for. Uh, I think one of the difficulty we are having here is that uh, we don't have that much money. Mm -hmm. The money could be much only in terms of projects. So the gold card program to me, temporarily still is, uh, is a uh, project-based funding. It's not a uh, normal track, mm -hmm. right? So. You can think of if there's a budget got cut in the future, or maybe some sort of uh, change. For example, the change of in power in the governments. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have different mindsets. They might change this policy. Then that means that you know there are a lot of adjustments on this uh, policy. We, we might see a different results out there. So it should be institutionalized. Right. It, sh it should be institutionalized. That's a good way to say. Uh, but unfortunately, I think that. Um, uh, our government has not realized that uh, it's very important for us to think of the ultimate goal of this policy. Are we going to see a, uh, a completely international society in Taiwan, pretty much as the one in Singapore or in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. where half of the population can speak English fluently, even taxi drivers? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to still you know, remain or, or maintain our own culture, where we speak Chinese uh, as the predominant uh, language, and others will be other kind of language, Japanese, or Korean, and stuff. But I, I still don't think that our government is ready for that kind of uh, you know you know final scene. But everything they are doing now is just step by step mm -hmm. and see what I can do. Uh, you know, see where the problems pop up, then come out to to fix it. I, I don't think that's good enough. So that's a very good point. We'll see how ready we are in terms of talent retention, mm -hmm. whether Taiwan has really created a condition to keep them here. We will right. talk about that later. We just spoke about how Taiwan's attempt to attract foreign talent through the gold card program is faring and a sudden increase in professionals moving to Taiwan since the pandemic started. Coming up next, we'll be hearing from Tom Fifield, National Development Council Gold Card Office Project Manager, who oversees all gold card initiatives at the Taiwan government. Let's now hear from the leader of the gold card program, Tom Fifield, Project Manager at the Gold Card Office of the National Taiwan Development Council. Tom oversees all gold card initiatives and coordinates with different agencies and missions abroad from the central government level. He spoke to me about the gold card program's ambitious goals and how Americans make up the largest chunk of the program. Let's take a look. 
we're part of a much larger plan to attract 400,000 migrants to Taiwan by 2030. Uh, so our office uh, works internationally. We're very fortunate to have had uh, 5,500 gold card holders uh, from 91 different countries. And the uh, U.S. nationals are, in fact, the largest contingent of that. Uh, I believe that sometime this month we'll pass the uh, 2,000th uh, American gold card holder. And uh, in order to make that happen, uh, we have studied the migration programs of other countries. And based on the migration programs of other countries, we use a range of techniques. We run seminars online or in person. We've invested in a great informational website. Uh, we uh, work heavily in LinkedIn to look at where the talent is and uh, where the talent is moving. Uh, we run a little bit of advertising. We, of course, work with the entire Taiwanese network around the world, including all of our diplomatic posts and embassies uh, in order to get the word out that Taiwan is open for talent. In terms of American talent in particular, mm. what do you feel is a deal breaker for them to uproot from the U.S. to Taiwan, which is, of course, um, 13 hours away, a huge ocean in between. Yeah, so uh, we uh, really study that issue quite carefully and uh, we're fortunate that uh, we recently ran a survey of gold card holders and uh, more than 1,000 responded. What we found is that the reasons that people move uh, countries are typically distinct to individuals rather than being able to be broadly attributed to countries like the US. Uh, so we found that people moved to Taiwan, uh, f you know, first and foremost because Taiwan's a great country. So about uh, a third of uh, our survey respondents said that. And they also mentioned uh, the work environment, employment, uh, and our friendly people, great living conditions, and, and so on. However, that's not to say there isn't problems. And uh, one of the uh, areas we have uh, data on uh, for a few years in a row now is the issues that foreign residents in Taiwan face when they're living here. Which isn't um, particular to just gold card holders. Uh, that's right. So we have data for gold card holders. We also have some uh, extended data for beyond gold card holders. And we thought, okay, uh, language barriers is probably going to be one of the biggest reasons that uh, someone from America might not want to move here. But uh, what we found is actually the number one problem that foreign residents in Taiwan face is banking. Uh, so there are difficulties opening accounts, getting credit cards, and that's a fairly fundamental service. Uh, so that's an area where we're working to improve uh, because it's necessary to uh, improve our migration environment to attract the talent and also to keep people here uh, when they do arrive. Tom, it'd be great if you could talk about how your office has improved such processes. Absolutely. So specifically uh, on banking, just for a second, uh, we were able to work with the Ministry of Finance, the financial regulator, and four state-owned banks in order to create a streamlined process for gold card holders to apply for credit cards and open accounts. And we're also uh, delighted to see that commercial banks, uh, such as Taishin Bank, last week uh, are launching products uh, for uh, foreign nationals specifically. Uh, so where they're acting as a bridge between the foreign resident community and the government apparatus and uh, Taiwanese industry to try and listen to that fire hose of feedback, analyze it, and then take action to improve our migration environment. Have you seen U.S. gold card holders become, say, permanent residents or even become Taiwan citizens choosing to live here long term? We uh, recently asked the gold card cohort uh, how many uh, people had plans to become uh, permanent residents. And uh, as of right now, about 4% of gold card holders have moved on to either permanent residence or citizenship. But about 60%, I think it was 58%, uh, was the specific number of gold card holders have indicated that they, they, they do plan to apply for permanent residence. And uh, we're really looking forward to having them in Taiwan long term. Do you feel what is the number one reason that keeps them here, um, aside from just moving here? Yeah, so uh, it, it really depends on the individual. For instance, uh, one large group of people from the US are remote workers, those who can be location independent. 
uh, from their employer. So about 35% of gold card holders, including many from places like Silicon Valley and other tech centers in the US, uh, live in Taiwan, but they're working for a US-based company. They pay taxes here, they can enjoy living in some of our amazing uh, cities uh, and uh, regional areas. And uh, that's just one group of people uh, and one type of reason that they uh, enjoy staying here. You just heard Tom Fifield speak to Rath about how the gold card program is doing and the issues that is still lying ahead. Let's now talk about what attracts such professionals and compares the program with Singapore's employment pass. So Nick, now I would like to um, direct my question to you. You just talked about the challenges of living in Taiwan, such as the language barriers. So what other challenges do you encounter after moving to Taiwan? And we just mentioned that Singapore has also has a very strong program in attracting foreign talent. Why did you choose to come to Taiwan instead of Singapore or other places? Yeah, so um, one of the things that uh, I like about Taiwan is safety, but uh, it's actually pretty dangerous, I think, as a pedestrian, just walking outside. Like, you really have to pay attention to your left and right because you, you have no idea when you're going to cross uh, a little tiny alley where there's going to be a scooter or even a car to just comes right by. And I've, I've definitely had some close calls. I'm pr probably lucky to be sitting here today. Um, it's uh, a jungle, you know? Yeah, <laughs> jungle yeah. In Taipei. And, and I, I don't understand why Taiwanese people are so nice when they're not in their vehicles. But once they're in their vehicles, they're just different people. They're just <laughs> wild, mean animals. Um, so as far as uh, um, why I chose Taiwan instead of Singapore, by the way, Singapore was actually when growing up in the U.S. Uh, and being exp like being around so few Asian people growing up. Singapore is actually I thought of Singapore as like this like oasis before having been there. Mm -hmm. Because of crazy rich Asians. <laughs> no, 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 no. Way before crazy rich Asians, I was like, oh man, uh, a a place a place in Asia where everyone is Chinese, so I can look like them, but they speak English, so that, that has to be where I want to go. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, uh, in the end, uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't pursue Singapore, but, um, but years later, while living in Taiwan and then visiting Singapore, I realized they made the right, the right decision because Singapore is just so small. Mm -hmm. um, and after three days there, I, was, I already had developed, my, more like two days, I developed island, island fever, and I just wanted to get out, go somewhere mm -hmm. else. Um, I, I find that less so here, and I think also I, I felt the same way just vis whenever I visited Hong Kong. Um, it's just it's just like you're you're in this like tiny enclosed space, and it's it's pretty claustrophobic, mm -hmm. I think. Whereas in Taiwan, uh, yeah, Taipei is not huge, but you can leave Taipei, you can go to Kaohsiung, you can mm -hmm. go to other parts of Taiwan, and or even and, some outer islands. Yeah, right? exactly, like Jingmen. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think Taiwan is just a lot bigger area to explore. Mm -hmm. Good to know that. <laughs> yeah. So how long do you plan to stay in Taiwan? Uh, as long as I can. Oh, well, good. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm I'm hoping to uh, get a permanent residency uh, at the end of my third year here. Mm -hmm. And also, a quick follow-up question is: do, do you have the chance to meet other gold card holders? What about their perceptions towards this program? Uh, for the most part, I think everyone has a pretty positive experience here. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't met the people who came and then ran away, mm -hmm. um, but I think that they came for the wrong reason. Like if if, they, if you if you came to Taiwan just to escape the pandemic, <laughs> then then I think I think that's the wrong reason mm -hmm. because there there's so much more to Taiwan than just you know uh, escaping COVID. Good. Talking about people going back, one of the largest groups is Americans. Um, Professor, you've lived in both countries and you have friends here. You are very well connected with the um, US expat community here. What do you feel attracts Americans to Taiwan? Um, I think uh, Nick just mentioned a great point. Uh, you know, number one, uh, he, he looks Asian, I mean, he's Asian, right? And he wanted to go to Singapore because uh, he, he will not look different from other people. And also, uh, Singapore, uh, Singaporean speaks uh, English. Uh, then I would say if 
the logic is correct, you can apply that to Taiwan because number one, uh, this is Asian society. Number two, both the United States and Taiwan are democracies. Whereas uh, in Singapore, because you might be an engineer, but if you were, for example, like me as a policy professor, then I will have a lot of challenges, even difficulty uh, in, in doing my job. In terms I, of direction. I cannot cr right. criticize the government. I cannot say something you know, uh, bad about the, 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 you know, the, the ruling family. You know, I might be in trouble, right? But in Taiwan, certainly you don't have that type of problem. But also it depends on what kind of career uh, industry you're in. But for us, uh, for uh, journalists, for uh, uh, social scientists, you, you, you will have that kind of problem. And it used to be another place was much better, Hong Kong. But unfortunately, after 1997, Hong Kong was mm -hmm. returned to China. And after this you know, turbulence in, in, in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is not Hong Kong anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so I think Taiwan is really the genuine, the authentic you know, free society. Uh, in the Chinese population, with a lot of Chinese population, this is the only place you can go. If you want to fulfill or kind of satisfy a lot of uh, requirements just mentioned uh, by Nick. Okay, anyway, that's, that's number one. Number two is that uh, I think um, because of China, because the, this, the, the, the rise in China are uh, pretty, pretty bully, pretty, uh, you know, uh, just push a lot of pressure on Taiwan and people don't like that. But we do have to acknowledge one fact is that Chinese becomes such a, a trend, you know, a popular language now. Uh, for example, if you want to do business with Chinese uh, companies, not necessarily uh, based in China, might be based in uh, Europe or even United States. You have to speak more or less Chinese, right? Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, do business uh, with the Chinese company uh, located in China, you still have to speak Chinese, right? And so only English is not enough. And people want to learn Chinese, but they do not want to go to China, right? Because that's not a democracy. So they instead go to Taiwan. And in fact, before, prior to 1980s, Taiwan is really the only place where you can pick up Chinese language, mm -hmm. I mean the skill. Uh, the, 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 the biggest camp is the, the school where yeah, you're currently Shida, in. That's yeah, Shida, 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 right. that's actually the biggest. <laughs> that's the biggest yeah. language center out mm -hmm. there teaching foreigners Chinese. Mm -hmm. Which we'll hear from later. Right, right. Yes. But after the open up of this uh, Chinese society, you know, either to economy or to all kinds of uh, globalization, people went to Ch China. But after the lockdown, people came to realize that that's not a country mm -hmm. we, we should go. And now right. we come, come to Taiwan. So that's another reason I think that American, uh, uh, our friends will come over Taiwan for a longer state. Yeah. So fascination over the language and culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And also the free lifestyle and the free the, lifestyle. Like, democracy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you also talked about issues such as wages. Mm -hmm. When compared to the U.S., Taiwan is probably mm -hmm. a fraction of what you could earn right. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. How do you feel Taiwan can work? Or there are ways, because we, we know there are expats that have been here 20, 30 years. What keeps them here? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, some of the international friends, they stay in Taiwan for longer uh, time or even for life. You know, the, the biggest reason for me, uh, as I can see, is that because their spouse mm -hmm. is Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's undeniable that the power of love is pretty, <laughs> pretty big, right? I mean, right. it, can, it, it can overcome a lot of uh, uh, difficulty that, that we are suffering from. But what about other than love? Yeah, what? Other than love. Hey. Other than love, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, too. Hey, hey, might my, 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 you know, drive you out of here. Or, Hatred of your own country. Or, or keep you... Hatred of your own country. <laughs> right. Because okay. of the state that the U.S. is in, in terms of some people say crime and all that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you that, see that? that? Yeah, of course. I mean, Taiwan is a very safe place, but we still have a lot of stuff to improve. For example, the traffic, right? The, as you mentioned, uh, as a pedestrian here, it's very dangerous to walk, walk around. But, you know, luckily, um, the, the police station, I mean, the department, the, the central uh, p police department now, they have uh, noticed this uh, criticism and they want to take it seriously. Uh, there are several dimensions to it, not only in terms of the safety of pedestrian, but also the design of the streets, right? In Taipei, uh, you know, you guys should feel lucky that you still can walk. In, in, on a sidewalk. If you go to mm -hmm. uh, my city, Taizong, it, it's very hard. It, it's, it's, sometimes you have to walk uh, on the street and, and kind of escape in those cars and pretty um, mean-spirited, like what you just suggested. So I think that one is like one, one of the 
thing that still show the in civilized parts of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. and we have to overcome that. Otherwise, it's harder for us to take one step further by saying that, yeah, Taiwan is now open to all kinds of uh, professional uh, foreign talents, you know, will come to Taiwan. Still, still one step uh, away from there. Yeah. Definitely, there's still room for improvement. Right, yeah. Right. We just discussed how Taiwan's gold card compares to Singapore's employment pass and other programs around the region. Coming up next, we'll be hearing from Mary Goodwin, National Taiwan Normal University Department of English professor, about why she decided to make Taiwan her permanent home. Let's now hear from Mary Goodwin, National Taiwan Normal University Department of English professor. Mary is a native of Oregon, but is also now a naturalized Taiwan citizen. She spoke to me about why she decided to stay and her long but personally rewarding naturalization process. Let's take a look. I think that growing up in a kind of uh, uh, upper middle class suburb in the States, uh, I think my greatest fear was that I would stay in that situation forever. <laughs> that it, it felt like everything, uh, nothing was new. And I wanted to go to a place where I would be an amateur forever, right? Where everything would be, something would surprise me every day, or there were many things I didn't know and had to learn. And I think this might be due to my personality more than, uh, more than just a, a, national, a choice of nationalities. But I like being in a place where I have to kind of figure things out. And I think Taiwan was also going through the same stage, right? Where it was trying to... Uh, trying to fix its own identity, trying to separate itself from a past that was painful in many ways and figure out what to do in the future. And I think Taiwan is still in that process and I really appreciate that uh, energy. Is there anything in particular in Taiwan that keeps you here? A lot of foreigners will tell you that we stay because the healthcare is good and we stay because it's basically safe. And I think to extend on that, uh, to expand on that, um, you live, we live in a place in Taiwan where uh, the leaders don't argue about basic human needs. Nobody argues that uh, universal health care is important. Nobody argues that they should have guns, you know, that people should have guns run around and defend themselves. And nobody argues that um, education should be as inexpensive and widely available as possible, right? Whereas in America, you have arguments about all of those very, very basic human needs. You know, do people need health care? Should they have guns? Uh, should only the elites be um, eligible for higher education? In Taiwan, that's not a problem. And so I really appreciate living in a place that kind of recognizes the sensible approach to keeping people alive <laughs> and keeping them educated. And I understand you actually naturalized to become a Taiwanese citizen. It started off as a very practical problem. At my university, at National Taiwan Normal University, uh, when we had conversations about retirement, um, it turned out that the retirement pension, the monthly pension that local professors could get, wasn't available for foreigners. Um, so, so we had some kind of, uh, uh, not protest, but we were very actively trying to change the Ministry of Education's mind about allowing foreigners to um, enjoy the same retirement benefits, the pension benefits that local people did. But then kind of out of the blue, <laughs> uh, the government took a completely different tack, which was to change the change the opportunity for dual citizenship, which removes all of our problems. Um, we don't have to worry about uh, whether we're uh, getting the same kind of benefits because it's possible to become a citizen. Has life changed since you become a citizen? Oh, absolutely. I've always been very proud of um, voting in the states. My state, Oregon, makes it easy to vote online, to vote by email. Um, so I can participate in the American um, electoral system pretty easily, but nothing, absolutely nothing made me prouder than to be able to vote in Taiwan. And it was, I voted in one, at least one presidential election, a lot of smaller elections. And I just feel so, um, you know, like I said, to be part of a country that takes uh, human needs and human rights seriously, probably more seriously than in America, 
Um, I just felt really proud to be part of that kind of evolving national identity. And I think that if Taiwan opens immigration further to the many people who are serious about uh, contributing to Taiwan, it can only do good things for Taiwan to, to break the link between citizenship and race or ethnic group and to allow more of a kind of a, a multicultural uh, participatory democracy can only be good for Taiwan. And Taiwan loses nothing by having these people uh, participate more fully. What advice do you have for Americans who are considering Taiwan as a future home or even just to come here to study or work? Wages um, could be a problem, especially in comparison to other richer countries. Um, but the trade-off is that you get uh, uh, the healthcare system is much more reliable and um, obviously much cheaper. Higher education is cheaper. There are a lot of kind of other benefits to quality of life in Taiwan that um, you wouldn't never expect in America, never expect. I know going back to the States, the first thing I'm worried about, many of my friends are worried about, is how to even insure yourself, get health insurance or accident or catastrophic insurance for just like a, you know, a, a three-week visit or something. In Taiwan, there's never that kind of uh, concern or worry that you're all on your own and that you could have a terrible illness and it will bankrupt you. So I think there are the trade-offs in Taiwan, quality of life, highly educated population, friendly, kind people honest people, uh, people with no guns. <laughs> there are just so many, so many reasons to recommend Taiwan. And especially as it's in the spotlight now and with its uh, big, uh, its problems with its big neighbor, um, it just makes you, I think, m a little bit more nervous, but definitely more very, very proud of what Taiwan has been, do has been doing. You just heard Professor Goodwin speak to Rath about why she prefers Taiwan to the U.S. and what she believes Taiwan can do to make the country even more attractive to those considering immigrating. After watching our discussion, do you feel like moving to Taiwan? Please let us know in the comments section of our website. Let's now discuss how that could be specifically done. So now I'd like to direct my question to Professor, mm -hmm. and I just want to know that at the end of 2022, Taiwan issued 6,351 gold cards, and the Taiwan government seeks to issue 10,000 gold cards by the end of 2023 and 20,000 by 2030. So what areas can Taiwan do more in order to attract the talent and to achieve these goals? Okay, um, just like uh, Professor Goodman uh, mentioned uh, you know, on, on the video clip, uh, one of the uh, strengths of Taiwan is the medical uh, insurance, right? We have such a great uh, medical care, uh, health care. Uh, I, I live in, in the States uh, for about six years. I, I, I certainly understand that how poor <laughs> foreign students can suffer <laughs> if you don't have uh, good insurance. Seriously, I mean, uh, a lot of people, just because they don't, they don't have enough money, they are not hired by somebody, they do not have that kind of coverage of, of, of their uh, patients' rights. But in Taiwan, you don't need to worry about that. Even you are as a international workers in Taiwan, uh, mi migrant, immigrant workers, like for example, the one taking care of my grandma, mm -hmm. uh, she has that kind of uh, benefits as well. So that's, that's one of the strengths. But she also mentioned one thing which I think she viewed it positively, which is a wage structure, right? Mm -hmm. And she, she that does a, a trade-off between the quality of life, but also uh, you know low wage system. Um, when we speak about speak of the the wage issue, we really have to think about the uh, the, the, the the life standards mm -hmm. in Taiwan. How much uh, you have to pay uh, in 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 the USD term uh, for lunch, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to one lunch uh, in the United States. Of course, it's much cheaper here, but still we have to think about how much we have to pay if we live in South Korea or in Japan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think in Taiwan, the problem is not only the wage issue for the uh, high-tech people or the highly educated uh, foreign talents, but also for ordinary per persons. So I think this is really urgent. Um, the, the burden is on us, uh, on the Taiwanese government, on, on all of us as Taiwanese. We have to work to, to make the economy much better. 
but now we, we also know that inflation is very severe. We have mm -hmm. to you know, overcome that too. That's a wage, uh, number one. Number three is the work habits. You know, a lot of people always tease in Asian, you know, like as an overwork <laughs> population. And, like and, robots. Right, robots <laughs> and working bees and mm -hmm. with, without any needs for leisure time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a recent example of the TSMC, uh, it, it has mm -hmm. a factory set up in Arizona, mm -hmm. a lot of our engineers came over there and they work like day and night. Mm -hmm. And for the local engineer, they, they just cannot believe it. Mm -hmm. This is not a life, right? Mm -hmm. Get a life, right? So we, we can see this kind of cultural uh, uh, kind of gap between the West mm -hmm. and East. Even for Asian Americans in the United States, they will have a different work habits uh, from the Asians, Asians in, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to reconcile that. But Com coming back to the institutionalized uh, rule, I think e everybody should be equal. Uh, our government should take care of not only the uh, domestic workers, but also the international workers, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of their health, in terms of the emo emotional health and stuff. So I think only in that uh, can Taiwan really become an internationalized society. And finally, the language barrier thing, I think, uh, both sides, both party has to you know, compromise a bit. For the uh, international friends, you really have to pick up, do your best to learn Chinese. On the other hand, we have to do our best to uh, provide or, you know, or uh, structure a in English friendly uh, environment. So maybe in the future, we can you know, structure French friendly mm -hmm. society in Taiwan, even Japanese friendly. Now, sometimes we do already, but still not enough. Mm -hmm. right? A follow-up question. You just mentioned TSMC engineers are being like hired by American companies. Mm -hmm. They're moving there. So in addition to attracting um, the foreign talent to Taiwan, it is also vital for Taiwan to keep our own talent. Mm -hmm. How can we right. strike a balance between the two? Right. Again, wage. Wage. <laughs> yeah. So if, if, like what I say, if you, if, if at the initial step, it's really hard for you to make everybody richer. So you have to, you know, do some strategy, which is kind of, you know, get some specific group of people highly paid, mm -hmm. but others maybe not as much, mm -hmm. right? And that's one of the strategies, you can do that. And, and make the, the group, they, they feel they are well paid, they're, 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 they're uh, being, being valued by the country, by the whole system, then so they are willing to stay in Taiwan for a longer time. And also, uh, those uh, segments of, of, of the uh, elites will not choose to go abroad to work in some, mm -hmm. somewhere else. That, that's one strategy, mm -hmm. which I think is more plausible to the Taiwan's economy now. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, I, I still think that even if you are a janitor or if you uh, work for some kind of uh, uh, labor uh, segments, you still have to get uh, paid well. Uh, in fact, that uh, now we have a shortage of labor in Taiwan, especially at the, at, at the basic level job. You know, in, in those kind of levels, you know, for example, workers to, to help to uh, build up the, the house and also uh, those kind of uh, cement uh, uh, workers. They, they really, uh, you know, we need a lot of them, but because the, the college uh, is so universal now in Taiwan, the people can enter college very easily.